Travis and, and Taylor love each other at this moment. <laughs> Just put your mind's eye in that place of, of embrace and of saying, um, you know, if it's a food or if it's a beverage that you're really into and you know something about it, uh, the more that you know, uh, hopefully this morning we can grow in our appreciation of coffee. Before that, oh, at the end of it, this time, I am going to tell you how to brew the perfect cup of coffee. So that's important. Um, before that, I would hope to entertain this question. From whence does coffee come? From whence does coffee come? Whence meaning, not when, but where. And not necessarily where, like what or where, but where, why, how. And so what we're going to do is we're going to ask this question and look at it from five different angles. From whence does coffee come in terms of its history, the context that it has come? From whence does coffee come in terms of place? And this might be the most literal, where does it come from? But as you can imagine, it has a lot of different answers to it. From whence does coffee come in terms of its variety? Variety, the spice of life. From whence does coffee come in terms of taste? One of my five favorite senses. And from whence does coffee come in terms of community? Community is the cure for the common commodity. All right, so digging in. From whence does coffee come? Some of you might know the history, the legendary history of coffee that includes Kaldi the goat herder from Ethiopia. This is a legend that was told at the, earth, the beginning of the 19th, 18th, 19th century, uh, but it date, the legend is meant to date back centuries. And, and this, this goat herd in the mountains of Ethiopia named Kaldi noticed that his goats were snacking on the red berries of a certain plant, and then all of a sudden, spontaneously, they were prancing, they were leaping, they were dancing. And much like if you were here a few months ago, that's what we were doing in this room. Uh, but we ate eight of the red berries of that tree. We were, we were dancing. Uh, so Kaldi joined suit. Um, what happened after that was that he passed the plant on to certain Muslim Sufi monks who used the caffeine of coffee to stay awake for their nightly prayers. Um, and this is how coffee became uh, prominent in the, the areas of Ethiopia and over into the Arabian Peninsula. Um, the legend uh, was recorded uh, and, and passed on, and from there, because of the energetic effect of, of this magical plant, um, the colonizers saw the opportunity. Uh, so the Dutch were the first to take it eastward. Um, they took it to Indonesia um, and so that they could use the, the trade route for the spices to get coffee back to Europe. Uh, coffee beans were left behind when the Turks invaded the city of Vienna, and a uh, opportunistic uh, person there saw the opportunity to take coffee beans and to share with his comrades, and, and what happened was Vienna became a city of, of exploding uh, coffee houses. It was, a, it was a cultural revolution of that city. Uh, London shortly followed suit, and as you know, the rest was history. The, the, the effect was, was monumental, and it was... It was so much uh, of a demand that there needed to be more of a supply. Again, the, col the colonizers took uh, the opportunity. Um, coffee was likewise smuggled um, from the French botanical garden and, and taken over to, uh, by, by a Frenchman to the Caribbean, uh, from there to Brazil. Um, so it shouldn't be surprising uh, that this non-native plant, oh, here's a, here's a slide of this is the view of our coffee shop on West 4th Street this morning. <laughs> this is what it looks like on most Friday mornings. But this was also the, uh, the view of the first coffee shop in Vienna. Uh, and, and this is the kind of place where, where life happens, where, and it's still this way today. Um, but, but we'll get to that later when, when history fasts forward to where we are now. Um, but as you can imagine, in North America, um, equally uh, influenced by colonization, opportunistic uh, coffee had a role to play. I'm not going to say it was directly, or it was the only thing responsible for the Industrial Revolution, but as you can imagine, um, the energy given by coffee has a lot to do with productivity, um, and the Industrial Revolution uh, had, it had a supporting role in that. Um, I want to share a little bit of my personal coffee history as well, because I feel like um, as interesting and legendary as this is, um, my own legendary memory has to do with uh, the smell of coffee 
uh, in a percolator at my grandpa's house. It has to do with my dad holding a styrofoam cup of really bad church basement coffee after church service. Um, it has to do with my, my high school and my college years. Uh, I'm from Cincinnati, uh, and so I don't know how many of you uh, visited Highlands Coffee House, still there. Uh, Cauley's Coffee House and Bookstore, RIP, no longer there. Uh, but Lookout Joe was, was around then, and, and Coffee Please in Madeira. Um, I worked with some coffee uh, at Great Harvest Bread Company. I, I think we all, they had an espresso machine, but I'm not sure what came out of it at that point. It, it probably wasn't good. Um, but all of those experiences are, are you know, are instrumental in, in connecting me to, to senses of, of family, of social connection, um, of, of, you know, interesting mo motivations around what we do together. Um, and so that's, that's part of my background, and, and part of Deeper Roots Coffee background is that a group of friends were all having similar experiences, sim similar um, interests in, in coffee, and uh, eventually we bought a roaster. And so this is a view of, of the very first roaster that existed in a dairy barn on an old farm in Mount Healthy. Uh, this history is, is something that you know is, is important to me, and I, I think you know hopefully through this presentation it becomes uh, a part of the, of the coffee culture in Cincinnati. Let's let's see what's possible here. From whence does coffee come? In terms of place, um, by a show of hands, how many are of you are from Cincinnati? Maybe half the room. All right. So that means everyone else, the other half of the room, is from somewhere else, but you're, there's unlikely that, you're all, that the rest of you are from the same place. Or it's a, so it's interesting to me that in, in any one place when you ask the question, where are you from, or are you from here, those of us from Cincinnati, like, we have some shared memories. We have some shared experiences, and we have some shared outlook on what it means to be from Cincinnati. Um, obviously, coffee comes from some place. Um, I'm going to let this video run a bit. Uh, these, are, these are views, uh, images of where coffee comes from. Um, as a coffee roasting company, uh, in this day and age, it's easier than ever um, to travel to coffee growing regions, to, to meet people who produce coffee, and to establish relationships in ways that um, hopefully are building toward a sustainable future. Um, that leads in, into you know, further discussion, but I really want to just highlight the place where coffee comes from. Uh, how about shout outs any coffee growing countries that you are familiar with and or, and or fans of? Coffee countries? Vietnam. Vietnam grows coffee, that's correct. Belize. Belize? Jamaica. Jamaica. Costa Rica. Costa Rica. Colombia. Colombia. US. US? Where does US grow coffee? Oh, Hawaii. 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 Rwanda. Rwanda. Those are great examples of, you know, we talked about the history of being rooted in Ethiopia. So in Africa, through the Arabian Peninsula, toward Indonesia, so nobody mentioned the island of Java, but Indonesia is, is a popular one in India. Um, Vietnam was an interesting, it, it, had, it hadn't grown coffee until the 90s, and so it's been a late addition to the coffee catalog, uh, but it quickly became the second most uh, largest producer of coffee in the world. Behind, anybody know the first? Guatemala. Guatemala is small, but mighty. Brazil. Brazil, huge coffee growing country, no more. So, as we mentioned, um, this is a dark history. Uh, coffee followed the waves of colonialism and exploited uh, the land that was available. It exploited labor, uh, used enslaved people to grow something that now uh, is ubiquitous around the world. And I think uh, the, the theme of the month being native, it's only appropriate to acknowledge that where we're gathering today, and all of the land that Deep Roots Coffee exists as a roasting company and has having our shops is, is the land of, of native peoples. People of the Osage and the Miami, the Shawnee, and before them, Hopewell and the Adena cultures. And this is a reality that I myself am just learning about how to live with in a responsible way. And if it's something that you're interested in, I would recommend looking up the uh, Urban Native Co Collective. They're a local group here. who are doing great things around uh, raising awareness and having events based about 
uh, who, the, who the native cultures were that inhabit the land that we inhabit now. Um, over generations, uh, after this, these waves of colonization, some of these places established themselves as uh, generational uh, coffee-growing regions. And over time, um, some of these coffees grew from just a commodity status into something that tastes and should be valued highly. Um, uh, Wendell Berry, who I forgot to mention, mentioned at the outset, will be sprinkled throughout this presentation. If you know Wendell Berry, he's uh, Kentucky's native son, born and raised there, and still resides with such a strong voice around farming, um, ecological responsibility, uh, and community as well. Um, when it comes to place, uh, Wendell Berry says, there are no unsacred places. There are only sacred places and desecrated places. Um, and, so, um, and so what that makes me think about are some of these places uh, where coffee was first grown uh, and still today are, are desecrated places. It, it, it's a non-native plant and it's not meant to grow uh, around the world. It, it does grow in the tropics very well. And for those who are inclined, uh, you can produce high quality coffee uh, in certain places. Uh, but this leads to my next poem, <laughs> which this one is, a, is in a personal tense, but I want to apply it uh, toward uh, the idea of place. It's called, in, 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 in terms of the uh, un, unsacred, there's no unsacred places. This is called The Consecration of Coffee by Rafael Jesus Gonzalez. Uh, one day of God, drinking coffee in my patio. Nothing is normal. Not the calla with its penis of gold or the iris like purple lava a volcano spills. I find in the depths of the cup chasubles embroidered with black moths and red stains. The sun fires a scintillation of silver bullets. There is blood in its shine. I place the cup on its saucer with the most tender care as if it were a chalice and recite the litany. Guatemala, Nicaragua, El Salvador. And one side of my heart tastes white and sweet, like cane sugar, and the other, like coffee, bitter and black. So to me, that represents uh, the bitterness of place and of people who are exploited for coffee. Um, but something in that consecration, uh, something of the beauty. So to continue my story uh, from those early beginnings in Cincinnati, uh, I chased some uh, questions that I had about my lingering questions and lived in Japan for three years. Uh, after that, in Vancouver, BC. Um, and it was there that I got a job as a barista. <laughs> it was, in a way, it was an answer to some of my lingering questions about what I should be doing with myself. Because being a barista at JJ Bean Coffee, which was a micro roaster, there, it was just a life-changing experience. It gave me an opportunity to serve in a way, a tangible way, um, that really fit the bill for what I wanted to do uh, going forward. Um, follow the thread as well from Deeper Roots, starting as a small roasting company. Uh, we opened, I moved back to Cincinnati after stints in Northern Idaho. Uh, I worked for various coffee companies there. And then got a job as a, a, in an office that was happened to be located in Missoula, Montana, but it was the offices of the Alliance for Coffee Excellence, which manages the Cup of Excellence program, a worldwide program in various countries, which is a competition for quality for coffee farmers. Um, like a lot of people, I eventually came home, uh, and that was when uh, we came up with the idea of opening a coffee shop in Oakley. I don't know if anyone has visited this location or remembers what it looked like more than nine years ago, uh, but it was right next door to Blue Manatee Books, and we shared that space. They operated it for 10 years before we took it over in 2015. Um, so that was our fledgling coffee bar there in Oakley. Place, place matters. Where, where, thing, where does coffee come from? Um, and where is it being served? Next, I want to move on toward uh, variety. From whence does coffee come? The idea of variety when it comes to coffee makes me think a lot about the idea of the variety that you had available to you with wine, uh, say 50, 60 years ago. Uh, your options were, would you like red or would you like white? And that, that was about it, you know. And, and since then, as you know, you can say the same thing about beer brewing in, in, up until the 80s or 90s. It was a pretty, pretty limited variety available. 
uh, until people realized you could you can make anything in beer, or you can you know you can you can pull some of the old traditional ways or some of the old recipes and really make anything. Uh, so how does variety uh, apply to coffee? Here's the coffee family tree. Um, as I said, it was kind of started in Ethiopia and from there branched out. The two that we're most concerned with are in this uh, in this part of the tree, which has to do with Arabica coffee. You've probably heard the terms Arabica and Robusta. Um, in general, Arabica are considered higher quality in general Robusta. They're more productive, they're more disease resistant, but usually a little lower quality in the case. Um, and so based on uh, where coffee is in the, in the world and, and what countries are, are handling it, they might um, take, a, take a, a piece of this and a piece of this and try this and make this in order to find especially more disease resistant uh, variables here. Uh, coffee is not a monolith. It has, it has such diversity to it, and yet, especially when, you get, when you're introduced to it, it might, not, it might not seem that this cup is different from that cup or one coffee different from the other, but the more you get into it, uh, the more interesting and exciting it gets. Uh, a great metaphor that I like to use is that of apples. Uh, you go to a grocery store and you have options of at least eight, nine, a dozen different apples. How about some apple varieties? Any favorites? Honey crisp. Honey crisp. Cosmic crisp. 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 Granny Smith. Granny Smith. Gala. What was that? Gala. Gala apples. Empire. Empire apples. Pink lady. Pink lady. Good one. Uh, here's a few of my favorites. There's the Gold Rush apples. That's the Melrose. The namesake Jonathan apples. <laughs> um, apples are a great metaphor because you know that they look different. They taste different. Their properties of, of tartness or sweet, of texture are different. And the same goes for coffee. Um, it's exciting to explore the variety that's available in coffee. Um, I don't know if you know the, the author, Michael Pollan, who's more, most famous for the Omnivore's Dilemma. He wrote a book called The Botany of Desire. Um, this is the Young Reader's Edition, which is interesting because in The Botany of Desire, Michael Pollan outlays uh, four different plants that have been the most successful or have been wildly successful in world history for using the desire of people as plants use pollinators and honey, you know, honeybees to, to propagate. And so what Michael Pollan lays out is that apples uh, are not native to North America. Right? That's something I take for granted all the time. It's as American as apple pie, and yet apples are from Kazakhstan. And so when they arrived, probably around the same time that coffee was making its heyday, it, they used the desire of people for sweetness to find a, a branch of the family tree that propagates sweet apples. Um, he calls out tulips and tells the history of tulips in the uh, Netherlands, and, and the, the desire there is for the desire of beauty. And so there was really like a, a laser focus on how to make the most beautiful flowers, and that's, what, that's how tulips became successful, using human's desire. Uh, in the non-Young Reader's Edition, he uses marijuana as an example of the human desire for uh, intoxication. Um, and then the final one is potatoes for our desire for control. In the Young Reader's Edition, he also highlights coffee and tea as a uh, human desire for energy and, and tells a lot of good history around the, the history of coffee and its propagation. Um, but one of, his, one of his quotes is, design in nature is but a series of accidents called by natural selection until the result is so beautiful or effective as to seem a miracle of purpose. It has become much harder in the past century to tell where the garden leaves off and pure nature begins. So again, just something that seems so ubiquitous, so taken for granted. Um, it's, it's easy for me to forget that, that coffee has made this wild journey around the world to get to where we are, and that the variety uh, is astounding. Like I said, some of those seeds and seedlings were smuggled from the old world to the new, and most of the family tree is, is built upon a very slim uh, section of DNA from those plants. There's still hundreds, if not thousands, of wild varieties in Ethiopia, and they deliver some of the most outrageous, wild, and delicious flavors. So there's a lot of exploration to be done, and it's all exciting work. Um, I would recommend to taste everything. Taste things side by side, get to know the differences, uh, expand your palate, um, even if you are interested in consistency and trying to make things uh, consistent for yourself, as you should be, uh, I like the, the truth that no one ever drinks the same cup of coffee twice. Uh, 
It's the same as no one steps in the same river twice because it's not the same river and you're not the same person. Um, no one drinks the same cup of coffee twice. And so taste is part of the equation. From whence does coffee come? It's a matter of taste. What do you like? Uh, a Wendell Berry poem, the wild cherries ripen, wild cherries black and fat, paradisal fruits that taste of no man's sweat. Reach up, pull down the laden branch and eat. When you have learned their bitterness, they taste sweet. Uh, and that, to me, applies to coffee as much as black wild cherries because there's a bitterness to it. You know, with wine, there's tannins, with beer, there's hops, and yet there's some acquired taste that comes with bitterness. With wine and beer, it probably has a lot to do with the social function. With coffee, it probably has to do with the effects of caffeine and, boost, and boosting our mood. Um, but like chocolate, like do you like chocolate? As well chocolate? Do you like co and chocolate is helpful because they give you a percentage. Like what percentage bittersweet do you like? Um, coffee should be bittersweet. I'm going to fast forward and leave taste behind. However, when I drink this coffee from Guatemala, and this is another thing where, you know, coffee in this day and age, you might take a look at the bag of coffee. This from, one from Guatemala. We put tasting notes on the bag, and uh, you can look at this and say, I don't want a coffee that tastes like palms. <laughs> but, <laughs> but the idea is that it's in there. You know, and when you taste coffee side by side, the question is, do you want an apple with tartness? Do you want an apple that's more sweet? Uh, because acidity shouldn't be a negative word, especially when it defines some you want know, fruit that has acidity to it. You want a meal that has that has a nice acidic pop to it. And so when I drink uh, this coffee from Guatemala, I taste this ripe, juicy peaches, stone fruits. I taste this, which is the sunrise in Guatemala. Come on, I taste this, the sweetness of toffee. I taste this, uh, making a cappuccino, and just the sweetness of uh, uh, brown butter toffee sweetness. And then when I drink this coffee, I think of this. This is Julio and his son Melvin who grow this coffee. These are our longest standing relationship partners in Guatemala. And the story of this coffee is one where 15 years ago, uh, my partners brought home 10 pounds in a suitcase, you know, with the, with the intention of, is there anything here that we can work together with people? They, they, had grown, their, they and their family and their community had grown coffee, but it was all sold internally uh, without any real opportunity for an exportable product themselves or for a market to, to partner with. Um, but over these years, it's been a wild ride of, of getting their coffee in, increasing quantities, increasing quality, improving qualities, infrastructure improvements, uh, to the point now where we import over 20,000 pounds, not 10 pounds in a suitcase anymore. And furthermore, this is a picture of uh, the future of coffee because Melvin grew up with this reality of my dad being a coffee farmer, um, working in community development, um, and now Melvin is responsible for a variation, when we talk about a variety, it's not just plant variety, but there's processing variety, there's all kinds of variables involved, but Melvin is uh, responsible for one of those, and it's very exciting to see. Um, from whence does coffee come? It comes from community. This is no surprise. This is a community of, of workers in Ethiopia, and that's the, that's the extent to which coffee is sorted uh, before it ever leaves the country. Um, this is a view of community. This is a very sneak this is a sneak preview of our shop to be open in Montgomery um, in the next few months. Um, and this is funny to me because, uh, as you pointed out, that this person working at the bar has a resemblance to me, <laughs> which I hope that I get to work at the Montgomery Coffee Bar, but I also hope that there's a lot more people here. <laughs> there's there, somebody over here. Uh, the, the thing about this rendering is, is, the, is the hope and the promise of community. Uh, we found that since we opened the coffee shop in Oakley, that people come out for coffee. People gather around coffee. There are conversations to be had. Uh, there are relationships to be formed and forged. Uh, many uh, many a, a, a romance has started in coffee shops. Uh, some people have sealed the deal with, with, uh, with weddings and, and, and have bringing their, their newborn babies. I mean, they didn't officially seal the deal in the coffee shop. <laughs> Here in Montgomery, um, yeah, the, the thing that's funny about this to me too is that it's this is um, not real. <laughs> you know, it's this is like coffee in the metaverse. And when it comes to community, I think one distinction to be made is community in real life <laughs> makes makes coffee so much sweeter than um, coffee conversations that often happen online. 
And so even though the word community uh, is used in online areas to, to describe what's happening there, um, coffee is one of the least, like if you see any posts about coffee, don't read the comments. It's, it's terrible. Um, it's almost like we're speaking different languages. Um, but what it points to, to me, is that people, people love their coffee. People take it personally. Um, people have strong opinions. Um, but when it comes to online communities, it's really hard to sit down with another person, talk about what is it we're tasting, how do you like to have your coffee, what's a good brewing method. Um, and so I'm more than grateful um, that I ended up in a community with these friends. Um, these are the partners that started Deeper Roots Coffee and a group of people who do have uh, that shared interest and that shared vision and the shared work. Um, they will be roasting all the coffee, backing all the coffee, delivering all the coffee back in the day. Um, and now we've grown. We're, we're <coughs> approaching 50 people working together, um, four different locations uh, with Montgomery on the way. And so for me, um, this community is, is one that has been um, the fruit of, of working with coffee. Um, that said, I'm going to tell you how to brew the perfect cup of coffee. <laughs> All right, whither will coffee flow? So whence does coffee come? From, from whence does coffee come? From where? Whither to where? But not where, but how and why. Why will it flow out of this room? Will it flow with you? Will you take anything and be um, more mindful, more uh, appreciative, more uh, focused on what, what is available in your cup? Um, so here's how you brew a perfect cup of coffee. You don't, right? Perfection <laughs> is an abstraction, and it's a journey. It's not a destination. If anyone tells you that they know how to perfectly brew a cup of coffee, they're trying to sell you something. So <laughs> don't believe them. Uh, do what you like. Uh, you brew you. You do your own thing. There are, no rules. There, there are, of course, helpful objective guidelines on how to brew coffee. Uh, but the real game is in the pursuit of pleasure. I'm engaging with coffee in ever more in engaging and exciting ways. It could be a long-term relationship, the one where the love for coffee and for community grows higher uh, and the roots grow deeper. I'm going to close with a poem. Uh, this one is from Joy Harjo, who was the U.S. Poet Laureate um, from 2019 to 2022, and she was the first Native American to hold that position. Um, and so it's not insignificant uh, to share this in this setting, uh, and to me it relates. This poem is, perhaps the world ends here. The world begins at a kitchen table. No matter what, we must eat to live. The gifts of earth are brought and prepared, set on the table. So it has been since creation, and it will go on. We chase chickens or dogs away from it. Babies teeth at the corners, they scrape their knees under it. It is here that children are given instructions on what it means to be human. We make men at it, we make women. At this table we gossip, recall enemies and ghosts of lovers. Our dreams drink coffee with us. Our dreams drink coffee with us as they put their arms around our children. They laugh with us at our poor falling down selves. And then as we put, our, put, our, put ourselves back together again once, at this, once again at this table. The table has been a house in the rain, an umbrella in the sun. Wars have begun and ended at this table. It is a place to hide in the shadow of terror, a place to celebrate the terrible victory. We have given birth on this table, and we have prepared our parents' burial here. At this table, we sing with joy, with sorrow. We pray of suffering and remorse. We give thanks. Perhaps the world will end at the kitchen table, where we are laughing and crying, eating the last sweet bite. Whither will coffee flow? I say, let it flow. Cheers. That's it. <laughs>